Okay, can you all hear me in the back all right? Okay, great. Uh, thank you for coming to the uh, fourth seminar in our series on commercializing uh, biomedical technologies. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the process of uh, uh, drug development in the, in the regulatory context. Now, uh, this is the last in the series of seminars, so let me set the stage for you here. First we start talking about patents. We come up with an invention and we file a, an application with the patent office to hopefully get a patent to issue on that to, so that you can keep anybody else from making your own invention. Then uh, we saw how you structure a license, which is an agreement by which in exchange for some amount of money, you give some permission to work your uh, patented invention. And then we talked about some of the ways in which you can build a company around this uh, patented invention. Uh, with things like uh, limited liability companies and uh, corporations and what some of the things were to take into account as you went out and started raising funding for this fledgling company. All right, so now you've got your invention, patented, you've got the license in place from the university, you've got your company started up, now what? Now you've got to think about how it is that you're going to start getting the necessary government approvals for uh, testing this in people. Because of course the, the idea here is to get a uh, approved human therapeutic product at the end of this very long process. And so today, we have my colleague, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Larson, coming to speak to us, who's an expert in this area of um, regulatory aspects of drug development. Uh, he's a PhD in pharmacology and toxicology. He spent many years uh, consulting in how to get your investigational new drug application in, in, in good order to send it to the Food and Drug Administration, how to carry out consultations with the agency about how to uh, structure your human clinical trials to their satisfaction, and then how to uh, uh, organize and orchestrate and carry out those phase one, phase two, and phase three trials. And um, uh, he is also uh, uh, currently down at the uh, uh, Texas Bio Alliance, where uh, he does quite a bit of consulting for uh, other universities who have these products that they're trying to uh, get through development, or for uh, biotech companies, in, um, mostly in Texas, who need this kind of expertise uh, along the way. And so without further ado, let me uh, turn this over to Jeffrey Larson. Great, thanks. Oh, so I have this on, although I don't need it. I speak loud enough anyway. So, uh, you guys can all move up. This is going to be interactive, and so it's a lot less like going to the dentist if you ask me questions along the way. Uh, and we have this kind of interactive dialogue because the slides are kind of uh, just background material. And so I'm not going to really go through the slides. I do this class. I do this lecture for another class, and so the slides are a little more important because they test, they ask you questions off the slides, but you guys don't have to worry about that. So you can just feel free to raise your hand and ask something as we go. So I really uh, like the process of drug development, and so I have spent 20 plus years in pharma, and I started my career at Romplank Rohr, which was Santa Fe Aventus, which is now Santa Fe Aventus. And I've worked at Allergan and killed a lot of uh, mice and rats with Botox. And I ran talks for one of the Charles River sites. And then more recently, I was at Tanox. And I'm kind of the poster child for working in pharma. And if somebody says, how would you like to try this, to, to say, yeah, I'll go ahead and do that. Because I'm a boarded toxicologist, so, I, so obviously I know how to do the tox studies. Uh, but I ran out of tox work at one of my pharma companies, and they said, hey, clinical, trial, clinical labs look just like animal labs, so why don't you go out and monitor clinical trials? And I said, sure. And so I got a little experience in running clinical trials. Uh, and then, of course, as you move up in the food chain, I, I started overseeing all of R&D. And so uh, if you're out and you have a job and somebody says, would you like to do this? Even if you don't know how, uh, you say, yeah, I'd love to learn, because that's, that's what you want to do. So uh, I really like uh, the process of developing medicines. And I like it because this, when you do something like this and you have something in a flask, it's actually going to go into people. So, uh, but it doesn't come with a label. And so everything that you've done in the lab to get to a point tells you kind of what needs to be on the label. And you need to go in to your development, do, into your research, having some idea of what you want to use it for. And that's what we're really going to talk about today. 
Uh, we're going to talk just a tiny bit about exclusivity because you've talked about patents and I want to put patents in, in uh, context with what it means to have exclusive rights to sell your drug because they aren't the same. We're going to talk about, probably most importantly, we're going to talk about how drug development, how what you do in the research lab really should work backwards from what you want uh, the label to read. And so you, you all know that when you get your medicine, you get it home from the pharmacy and you take it out of the box, there's this little label that you need your reading glasses to, to you to see and it talks about what it's used for and what it's indicated for and all the side effects and everything. Uh, and so that you have to kind of, when you're even in your research lab, you have to have an idea of what you want all that little letter letters and words to mean on your product, even though you're 15, 10, 15 years away from it. And then we'll talk about what to, briefly, if we have time, we'll talk a little bit about what the first step in getting your drug in front of FDA, uh, the IND application is. So we are, you've heard everything about patents, and you know that you have 20 years to do patents and, uh, before the life uh, is done. So I want to put patents in context of money uh, because while I, I really like getting a drug into clinical trials and then hearing from the clinical people if it's working or not, and pharma companies like that too because they proudly put up the medicines they sell, it still is a business and so you can't, uh, you can't be in the industry and not want to make money. So it's, it's a little bit about money, and I want to put money into context. And so if I have a drug that makes $360 million a year, so that's, that, that sounds like a lot, but it's not. It's not a blockbuster, but it's about break even. So pharma, if you come to them with an idea and you say, okay, you know, our market research shows that we can probably make $365 million a year, pharma might start getting interested. Blockbusters now are making three billion and not 365 million, so it's, it's a lot less, but imagine $365 million a year. So that's a million dollars a day. And so a million dollars a day, keep that in your mind. And when you think about, <clears throat> now I'm doing research and my patent's running, and it's running at the rate of a million dollars a day. So if I say, well, I'm gonna do, I ran this study, this xenograph study in mice, and it was a 28-day study, but I didn't have enough mice in the study or something happened and the room went out of whack and, and the mice died and I have to repeat it. And that's not a big deal, right? It's only a month that I've lost, but it's a month. It's 30 days. It's times a million dollars a day. It's $30 million you've lost. Or if I'm doing a talk study and something happens a month into it and I have to repeat it and I have to reorder the animals and I lose 60 days, I think. You know, 60 days isn't that much, but it's... $60 million if it's a million dollars a day. If it's a blockbuster, it's $600 million that you've lost. And so pharma is really interested in this patent life. And, and FDA is really interested in that patent life too. And what they worried about was that, you, that drug development's a long process and you can piddle away the time and you can get to the end, you can get in the middle of your clinical trials and you'll be out of patent life and then anybody can step in. So FDA passed a series of acts, or Congress passed a series of acts, that kind of gave people more incentive to develop just beyond patent, and it's exclusivity. And so you have, FDA grants you exclusivity, different types of exclusivity. They'll grant you a five-year exclusivity for a new chemical entity, and the exclusivity was around the moiety. Uh, other companies can't pursue other indications, even if they like your molecule for something else. And competition really can't come in, so you won't see generics until really seven years because you can't, uh, you can't submit an application, you can't start doing any work as a competitor company until the five years is up. So you essentially get seven years. So seven years, if you think about, so it takes me a little while to ramp up, but you know, a million dollars a day to $10 million a day, you know, seven years is a lot of money. So, you know, if I have a $10 million or a $10 billion Humira, drug, that's a lot of money to be able to sell it for seven years. So the, the incentive's there now, to, regardless of where my patent is. But it gets a little bit less if, if I cut down the time. So I, I see some people come and they'll say, you know, I, I started doing something with this drug, it's off patent, uh, and, and 
it's kind of known in the literature that might be, be, for example, it might be an anti-cancer drug. Somebody published some work 10 years ago that showed that it had some anti-cancer effect. And so I've done some more work, and I've given in these xenografts, and it's a, it's a great drug. It really works great. Why isn't pharma interested? You know, I talk to pharma, and they, and they say, well, you know, have you got any patents? No, I can't get a patent. Have you got any uh, exclusivity? Well, maybe I can get three years, but it, it gets to, it's not enough money. And so pharma doesn't get interested. So you might be working, and you might be doing research on a compound you think that's really cool. Uh, and you wonder why pharma's not interested. And they're not interested because if there isn't any patent around it, and they can't get a, a period of exclusivity, they can't make any money. Uh, you can try to get, to get uh, pharma interested in your drug as an orphan drug, because orphan drug is seven years. So, you know, Congress passed this Orphan Drug Act saying, let's try to get, encourage pharma to go in uh, and work on drugs that there aren't a lot of people that have the disease, because otherwise there isn't any, any impetus for them to do so. But actually, there's a lot of impetus for them to do so, because some of the more expensive medicines are ones that are orphan drugs. And so uh, Alexion Solaris is like a half million dollar a year for each patient to treat. Uh, so Congress probably didn't need to pass that act, because as long as money talks, nobody really cares. So pediatric exclusivity was a nice thing Congress passed. So that exclusivity says that if I had a drug for an adult disease, so I had a drug that's an adult cancer, and I say that I'm going to check to see if it will treat a pediatric cancer, and I get ready and I run this study, FDA will automatically add six months onto my adult indication, my adult exclusivity, and so think again, one to ten million dollars a day for six months, that's, you know, it could be 360 million. Uh, and you don't have to show that the drug actually works in kids, you just have to have done the trial. So that's a, a really nice exclusivity. Prior art, you guys have already heard a little bit about prior art. Uh, we've already talked a little bit about why pharma is interested. Uh, and I'll just say that in a research environment, there's always this impetus to publish or perish, and there's this impetus to say, let's, let's submit an abstract. And I'd say, until you talk to your tech transfer office, if you think that there's any possibility that this could be a drug and make money, uh, talk to your tech, tech transfer office and make sure that they know what you're doing. And they may say, why don't you just hold off just a little while, while we get uh, uh, some some paperwork in place so that it isn't prior art, because the minute you get it out there in the literature without having it protected, uh, it's prior art and the patent's, the patent's gone. So thinking about the $1 million a day, $10 million a day if it's a blockbuster, I, I want to do things that speed my development along. So I don't want to, most people look at this and they read these papers that talk about, okay, so I'm going to develop a drug, and that's my goal here in the research lab. I'm going to develop a drug, I'm going to get something in my research lab, and then I'm going to spin this company out, and then I'm going to become a CEO, and I'm going to get into clinical trials, and then I'm going to sell it off to pharma, and I'm going to be a millionaire, and then I'm going to retire, like Nancy Chang at Tanox, except she didn't retire because she really likes the process. But, but if I look at this process in, in going forward just step by step and saying, okay, now I'm going to do this. Now I'm going to put it into tumors. I'm going to put it into a bunch of different tumor cells and see if it works. And oh, it did work. And it worked in these panels. So now I'm going to put it in a bunch of three or four different xenograph models. And I'm going to put it sub-Q. And maybe now I'm going to do orthotopic. And now I'm getting interested in thinking about doing my GLP talks and, and oh, shoot, I should have thought back here how I was going to make the drug, but I'll start thinking. Now I need quantities that I can't make anymore in the, my research bench, so I'm going to go get a CMO, and they're going to you know, start making my drug for me, and I'm going to do my talks, and I'm going to get into clinical. And if I do that, that kind of step by step without thinking about where I want to be at the end of the day, then I can make a lot of mistakes, and I can do a lot of things, and I can spend a million dollars a day for a lot of days before I realize that I don't have anything or that I haven't done what I should have done to get to, I didn't do something early that would have helped me inform what I should do later. And so that's what we're going to kind of talk about 
that instead of looking at it, this as a path saying, I do this step, and then I do this step, and then I'll do this next set of steps, and then I'll get out to here, and it'll take me uh, 10 years, and I'll, I'll be rich, and I can retire. Instead of doing that, I need to think about what it is that I want to sell at the end of the day. So I've got that stuff in a flask, and I have to think about what it is that, that I want at the end before I start doing a bunch of studies. So it really is working backwards. So I need to think about all these things that I'd like to answer. And so I need to think about what my clinical trials are going to look like. I need to think about what my patient population looks like. And I need to think about how I'm going to manufacture. And I need to think about what my talk studies are going to look like. And we're going to talk about a little bit about each of these as we go. I need to think about, can I make it? And I, can I make it in a cost that the market will bear? So maybe I have a really complex chemistry uh, problem that I've solved with my medicinal chemist friend, and it's a 200-step process, and the yield is 1% at the end of the day. But at the end of the day, I get this cancer drug that's fantastic. But my cost of goods going in is $10,000 a gram, and I need multiple gram quantities to treat a patient. And so it would cost me my cost of goods alone if I use that process, would make, take $2 million a year to treat a patient. And, and that's great, except the market won't bear that. So I have to be thinking, well, the market, can I make it, at a, at a, can I make it and make any money? Because remember, it, I, can't, uh, I can't try to sell something. I can't lose money each dose I sell in pharma. So patient population. So I, I'm just going to not read off the slides. I'm going to give you some examples uh, in my career where the patient population should have driven uh, research and it didn't. And so one of the first thing, one of the first projects is, so if, imagine I have a, a drug that I've shown can prevent lung cancer. And so I, I've screened lung cancer cells in vitro and I do my lung model. Uh, and I have the drug on board the couple days beforehand, then I implant the tumor cells orthotopically into the lung, or I do a metastasis model, and voila, it works really great. I don't get any tumor take in the lungs. And so I'm thinking, I have a perfect drug to prevent lung cancer. And I also did the study where I waited until they actually got lung tumors, and then I treated them, and it doesn't do anything. It's a dud. But I look at this other set of data and I say, wow, so I really have something, so I could prevent cancer. And then I go out and I try to sell my idea because I can prevent lung cancer. And the problem is that I have to look back at what my label is going to be. So my label is going to be for prevention, for not treatment. And I have to think about how I'm going to run a clinical trial. So how do I run a clinical trial to show prevention of lung cancer? Because say, I'm, and I'm just going to make up numbers, Say that one in a thousand people will get lung cancer in their lifetime. And so I have to enroll a thousand people at some point in their life, and I have to treat them with my drug, and I have to show that it prevents lung cancer in that one that's going to get it. And say my drug works only 50% of the time. So I have to enroll 10,000 people to get 10 people, and I have to enroll 100,000 people to get 100 people to start getting a meaningful patient population. So you can see that the pop that the that the trial just gets too huge. You can't run a lung prevention trial and make any money. Because not only do I have to worry about, well, how can I pick the 1,000 patients, but I also have to think about the time. And so I have to think about, well, do I start treating you when you're 21, and then you aren't going to get lung cancer either way until you're 50, and so I have to follow you for 30 years. So you, you can see that that sometimes what sounds like a really good idea in research isn't, doesn't translate because when I start to think about how does that look like in the clinic, I can't do it. It's too much. And that's why, we talk, why you hear clinical people talking a lot about biomarkers because you could still develop a drug for the prevention of lung cancer. If you could say, I don't need to treat 1,000 people, but I have I have biomarkers that I can assess for, and I can look at some protein in the blood, and I can take it down to, I can predict out of that 1,000 patients, I can narrow it down to 50, 
and uh, one of those 50 will get lung cancer. And now I can start, and they'll get it within five years of me detecting this in the blood. So suddenly you see I have a, I have a program that I can run. I have a clinical trial that I could do because it's small enough and it's short enough time. So I could still test my drug in prevention for lung cancer, but, I'd ha but I have to figure out how to do it in a manner that works. You guys aren't raising any hands and doing anything for raising questions. <laughs> No, so you, the exclusivity period for FDA works that they don't count the time that they're reviewing it, that you're doing the clinical trial and that they spend reviewing it. The exclusivity clock starts when they approve your drug. Okay, so it isn't, it isn't that I wouldn't want to do that 30-year trial because my exclusivity would be long gone. I don't want to do that 30-year trial because if I'm spending 50 grand a year on a patient, and I've enrolled 500,000 patients, and I'm following for 20 years. It's it's a bazillion dollar trial, and I just can't do it. So I had another another trial. So how many of you are parents? So I'm a parent. So I had another one uh, where I used used to be the angel of death. At, one of these, one of my companies, because I would, I would look at the research and say, yeah, this isn't going to work. And so I had one research scientist, brilliant guy, great in the literature, knew everything in the literature, was always looking for potential projects. And so he had identified uh, meconium aspiration syndrome as a, as a good use of one of our drugs. And meconium aspiration syndrome is, is not seen very often, but it's seen in uh, infants, and they come out and they're called blue babies. And they aspirate a little bit of meconium and they don't know if that's involved, how that's involved, but it's, it's called meconium aspiration syndrome and they come out blue babies. But you don't see it very much. But he had done some work in pigs mimicking this disease and he, we had an antibody that, that was really good for, for treating that syndrome in pigs. <clears throat> but there were a couple things. Uh, that you had to have it on board and you had to you had to manipulate the model around. But he got past the he got our board interested in this uh, because it worked so well. And I said, and it took me a while to kill it, because I said, how are you going to do that clinical trial? Because you don't see it very often. So just imagine so the science can be great, but imagine what that clinical trial looks like. So you can't predict that, that you're going to have one of these blue babies. You don't know until, until you have it. <clears throat> so imagine you're in the delivery room and everybody's excited and you're getting ready and, and you, you now know, because you all raised your hand, that you're, you're in the delivery room and they pop the baby out and you're looking and you're like, is it gonna, and, you're, uh, and suddenly the doctor says there's something wrong. And you kind of notice that the head is flopping a little and, and you have to inform consent. And so I said, just imagine you're going to try to inform consent. One, you're going to have been to all these hospitals uh, out getting nurses on board and doctors on board uh, to just in the rare chance that they might see this. But not only that, but when they do see it, you're going to say, I have this potential thing we can use. And you're going to try to inform consent. And in the middle of the hysteria of the parents, you're going to try to get them to make a rational decision on whether or not they should uh, use your drug and then you're going to call down to the pharmacy and you're going to try to get it upstairs in time. I said, you can't run this trial. There's no way that, it, just think of the logistics of it. And it took me running them through that scenario to get them to say, yeah, so the science is really great, but there's no way we can do that trial. And so that's the kind of thing uh, to think about as, as, you're, as you're doing your research. Can I run a clinical trial in this area? So maybe I'm thinking about going into cancer, or let me use a different one. Let me say I'm going into age-related macular degeneration. You know, and you're thinking, this is a great area to be in because the population is getting older. The problem is that the medicines they use for that now are really, really good. And so we had another drug that we thought, let's, our scientists had said, this works great, and I did this monkey CNB model, and it worked great. 
But the problem is that Lucentis and Avastin on the side and Regeneron's uh, and drug work really good in this. And so the response rate is like 98%. So you start to think, can I enroll a trial when, the, when a patient comes in and they've got age-related macular degeneration, you can't see straight. You can just see stuff on the outside. When they come in, the physician says, I've got something for that, and it works pretty good. I can't enroll that trial because I can't, I, there's just no way I can get somebody to say, yeah, you know what, I'd like to try that experimental therapy that's not really worked yet, instead of getting the approved standard of care that's effective in like 98% of the people. So, so you have to think, think like that. You know, is it, is it you know, the, whatever the cancer of the day is, that all large pharma is, and I have a really little company, and I'm competing, and I know that Glaxo's in that area, and Smith Klein, BMS is in that area, and Novartis is in that area. And so I, I think, can I enroll patients? Can I get anybody interested in my trial because all the big boys are in it? So it, looks, it might look really good in the research lab, but it doesn't look so good when I look at the competitive landscape. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. Yeah, so I th so I'll just throw up what I think, because I haven't really worked in, in those areas. Uh, but one is the animal models aren't great. And so I don't have anything. It's not like I can, put, I can put human tumors in a mouse and watch them shrink away to nothing. There isn't, there isn't a great model for that, for that. And then the second one comes kind of back to prevention versus treatment. And so a lot of the, the research is saying, if I stop early and I do this intervention early, I can prevent. And it, it's a lot harder to to, because you have to figure out how do I predict that somebody's going to get Alzheimer's. If I need to try to start treating them when they're 50 because they've got some kind of biomarkers, how do I, uh, how do I identify what are the biomarkers? And I think as research keeps going and can identify and narrow this population down and say, yeah, at 50 you have these risk factors, genetic risk factors, then maybe you can start, you'll start seeing some more more clinical trials in that because it'll be easier to pare that trial down. The other thing is, you know, how do I treat? So, you know, it, we don't really treat cancer until you, we see it. <laughs> so, you know, how do we, once somebody, you know, comes in, how do, how do we, do we know, understand enough about the disease to, to make it regress? We can maybe stop, try to slow it down. Uh, but it's harder to, to think about cures. Uh, and it's hard to, look, to think about successes, I think, for pharma. And pharma's are pretty risk averse. Mm -hmm. And how compelling, you know, how compelling the data is, what the clinical trial would have to look like, what kind of markers you could look at. You know, they think you can look and say, well, we were sure that five years ago it was the tangles. And now people are saying, well, maybe, maybe that, that isn't a cause, maybe it's just a marker, and it's an effect of something that happens upstream. And so I might even figure out how to reduce the number of tangles, but it doesn't do anything uh, clinically to the patient because I'm missing, and even if I, if I don't, even if I do have an effect, I don't do anything to the underlying what's causing it. And so I, it's, yeah, I mean, that's what I would, the lack of really good animal models that would get somebody up, jumping up and down, uh, and saying this is going to be, you know, this works really good in in the animals, and and we should try it in people. Okay, so let's talk about a little bit about what manufacturing, how manufacturing can drive. So I have tons of examples in this. So I had. Uh, I had uh, an asthma drug that we were developing, and we uh, were going to do sub-Q. 
because we didn't want to do inhalers. And we were, were thinking how convenient it would be to just have a, have a child get one little shot, sub-Q, once every couple months and then be protected from asthma. And everybody thought that was really great. And we did the animal models. And to get the animal model to work, to get the mice models to work, they, you put them in these little plastic chambers and you give them a little old albumin, they kind of struggle for breath a little, and then you, and you put the drug on board and show that, that they've struggled less for breath. To get to work, because of the way that the protein was, it wasn't very soluble, we had to go and give like 0.25 mils, like five on each side of the back, and load them up and get it to work. And so every, when the research scientist does that, they think that's great because it works. They don't give any consideration to, okay, so talk to me about what you, had, what you gave to the mice with. Well, you know, it's not very soluble, so we had to give a dose volume of like 10 mils per kilogram, and we had to spread it out. And I, and I, I said, so are we, doing any, are we doing any formulation work? No, we, 10 mg per mil is about what we're going to be at. I said, so that if I do the math, it comes out to like 50 mils that I'm going to have to convince some mom that once a month she's going to inject into her kid at like a half a mil at a time. It's not going to work. And, but it works really great in the mice experiments. Like, well, you need to get the solubility work done. And if it's a brick, then we don't have a product because you have to start looking and working back. So I have to work back from the label and say, so anybody else doing sub-Q in asthma? Yeah, or sub-Q in any disease in pediatrics? Yeah, so what's the dose volume that they're giving? And what's the frequency? Well, why would we need to know that? Well, because you need to know it from a marketing standpoint to say, okay, so patient uptake, mom's willing to do it, are, is going to kind of be driven on status quo. And I can look and say, you know, for this particular indication, it was okay to do a mil per kilogram because they only had to do it every three months. And it was for, a, but for a, this indication, you'll never get, it'll never be, taken up into the market, and so the market drives it. We had another one that we had an antibody for HIV, and we had to give it IV. And so we did a lot of market work from a couple different perspectives. So the first thing we did was worked with the team and said, so if you had an antibody that worked in HIV, how often would the patients be compliant and come in and get it? And so there was this big, because we knew uh, in a monkey model that if we gave it every two weeks, it worked pretty good. And it was a little less effective if we, if we gave it every four weeks. But we had to ask the question from a marketing term, will we be, we be able to sell it to patients if you tell them you have to come in every two weeks to get an IV infusion? And the marketing people said, you know, I think that we need to have it once a month. And so I said, we don't run a clinical trial then where we have an arm that gets it every two weeks because it's not going to be financially feasible. We also had a problem with cost of goods, and antibodies are pretty non-toxic except for uh, T. generos, but they're pretty non-toxic, and so you can give quite a bit of amount of antibody. And they said, when should we stop for HIV? And I said, well, the cost of goods is maybe 40, 50 grand a year, and so if we're going to, if you're going to escalate into a dose, cohort of patients where the cost of goods is 40,000 and we can only sell it for 50. We can't, we can't do it. We shouldn't, we shouldn't do it because we'll lose money every patient that we sell the drug to. And back then, 10, 15 years ago, HIV had a really strong uh, lobby force. And so I say, the last thing you want to do is run a trial, run a dose cohort, show it really works well, and then tell the HIV community you're killing it because you aren't going to make any money. So, you know, think before you start, before you go down the path. What, is, what, do we, what does the dose regimen have to look like before we can sell it? You know, if everybody else is, is doing uh, an inhaled product, and we think that we're going to do an IV product because the solubility sucks, or our animal models, we've only done IV and we don't know how to do inhalation, then it's not going to be a product because everybody else is in a specific space where inhalation is how you do it and it's convenient, and you're suddenly going to try to change the treatment paradigm. 
So you have to, and you need to be think about these th things while you're doing the animal research. So you may be thinking, it's okay, I'm just doing IP mice now because I can put it in DMSO and I just need to think if it works. The problem is that you do it and you show these really great results and you spend six months and you get really nice data with your drug, IP and DMSO, and you haven't, if you haven't done any work in that six month time to say, so is this thing a brick? And we need to give it, to be competitive in this market space, it has to be oral. It can't be IV because everybody else has oral medications. So can you get uh, this drug in an oral form and can you get it out of the stomach into the bloodstream? You should be doing that work while you're doing uh, your IP in DMSO showing that it works because, you, because you're thinking, I, I need to transition into the dose form uh, that we're going to be able to get, have large pharma interested in. So tox and PK, the, I always put this slide up, one, because I'm a tox person, and the other is to say that the goal of the toxicologist in pharmaceutical industry isn't to, to, to show that the drug's safe. A lot of people think, oh, they, I ran the toxicology study and I didn't see any toxicity at any of the dose levels, so that's great. And the, question, the answer is, is not great. It means we have to do the study over. Because the reason we do that talk study is because we want to show, we want to be able to tell the clinical people. So if somebody starts ODing on this in the clinic, or somebody has a reaction, starts exhibiting toxicological signs, what are they going to look like? So I need to be able to tell the clinical person. So when we start seeing dogs go down two weeks after dosing with this compound, they start going downhill fast, they stop eating, and they start losing body weight, and the BUNs and creatinines go up dramatically. And importantly, if we stop dosing those dogs, when we see that, uh, they recover, make a full recovery. That's really useful information now for me to take to the clinical person, because I can say, so we know some, we know what's going to happen bad with this drug. We know that the kidney is going to go if, if anything's going to go, and so you really need to, every, minute, every visit you're monitoring these clinical patients, you need to be doing BUNs and creatinines because that's the first sign something's going to go wrong if you see that start to rise. And if you see it start to rise, uh, then you need to get them off the med. Uh, but the good news is that they will recover, that if we see a, a, if they spike and increase, we can tell you that at least in animals that, the, that they fully recover and there aren't any lasting lingering effects. <coughs> and that's important because some drugs don't have, some drugs have lasting lingering effects. So if you're on doxorubicin, and you're getting doxorubicin uh, for your cancer, their, their clinician is keeping track of how much they're giving you because every dose you're getting, you're causing damage to your heart and it's not reversing. And so you'll get to a cumulative dose where they'll stop giving you doxorubicin because now you've done so much damage to your heart that they say we, we won't keep dosing you and it's not going to reverse. So that's a really important thing to know to tell people. So when I get into the, the talk studies, I'm trying to, de to determine a lot of things. I'm trying to like tell people what's the dose response because sometimes the dose response is scary. I have a drug that I worked on that didn't do anything at 22 milligrams per kilogram. Dogs tolerated it, jumped around, were perfectly normal. And then uh, at four times the dose, at 88, uh, more than half the dogs fall over and they die. And so it's really quick. <laughs> You'd like to see a dose response that's kind of like this, so it's 20, nothing happens, 200, they lose a little bit of body weight, and then 600, they don't like it, and a couple of them die. Instead of 20, nothing happens, 60, half of them are dead. So if I see a kind of dose response curve like that, I have to think about what disease I'm in again, because, it's, because it comes down to risk benefit. And so in a cancer, maybe I'm willing to take that kind of, okay, the dose response is like this. I'll just go into a population that's refractory to everything else, that they don't have any other treatment options. They sign the informed consent knowing they're getting this, with the, but that it's a pretty highly toxic drug. But look, the risk benefit is they're dying if they don't get your drug. And so they're willing to take, well, I might get, I might blow up my kidneys, but I'm, let's give it a shot versus this risk, this dose response like this, where I say, uh, I was thinking about a drug for rheumatoid arthritis, and I've got a lot of other treatment options, and, but this works really good in arthritis, but 
but the dose between when it works really good to the dose where the patient doesn't do so good uh, is pretty short, is pretty low. And I start, start to think that, you know, the risk benefit going into that indication with this drug isn't going to be very good. For pediatric asthma, you know, if you, you can't tolerate very much risk in pediatric asthma because, you know, inhaled steroids work pretty good for kids uh, with asthma. If it's really bad, they'll, they'll give them shot, IV shots. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So FDA has really, really nice guidances, and ICH has a really nice guidance. Uh, so you all know what ICH stands for: International Conference of Harmonization. So ICH, a great website because they're harmonizing what you need to do for drugs across regions. So it used to be that in Europe you had to do. Uh, something different than you had to do in Japan, than you had to do in the USA. So when we used to do reproductive talk studies in the US, uh, we'd have to redo the study in Europe because Germans wanted to see it different, wanted to see the rabbit study conduct a little bit different. So ICH, International Conference on Harmonization, is, has now published a series of guidelines and what you need to do uh, for, comp for drug itself, uh, quality, so it's, they're called the Q guidances, the S, the safety guidances for preclinical, what you need to do, and then the E, efficacy, what you need to do uh, in the clinic to show that it works. So they have those three categories, and then they have an M category, multidisciplinary category. So ICHM2 talks about what studies you have to do to get into clinical trials. And you generally, it's two, do, it's two species, it's a rodent and it's a non-rodent and the duration needs to support your clinical trials. And it's usually, uh, it's usually four weeks. And so generally, if I've done a four-week GLP talk study in rats and one in dogs, then I'm going to be OK. But I have to give some consideration to what, the, what they want to do in the clinic. So I had, a, I had an antibody that we were going to administer once a month. And we thought we would see a response at four months, the clinical person said. I said, when, when will we be able to tell if it's working? You know, when would you say, OK, so it's not working. Let's try something else. And he said, about four months. I said, OK, so that's four doses. So let's do a four-dose talk study, because I need to have four doses in animals to support four doses in people. And it comes straight out of that guidance. And so a lot of it is, while it's cookie cutter to say it's usually it's a four-week study in two species, uh, you'd, does take a little bit of what, what are they doing in the clinic. Now, if it's a biologic protein, it, dogs and rats would pick it off as foreign right away. So if I had an antibody, I wouldn't do a tox study in rats or dogs because after 10 days, their immune system has mounted a pretty good challenge. And the, you'll just be dosing them with water. So I'll use monkeys in that case. And I won't use rats. So in that, if I had a human Protein, I would probably just do my tox studies in monkeys, and I wouldn't worry about rats and dogs. So this talks a little bit about your question, you know, using the relevant species. So if I, had a, if I have uh, an antibody that isn't recognized as foreign, so like VEGF is pretty highly conserved across species, so I can do uh, studies with a VEGF peptide in rats and dogs, because what I want to show is if I, if I give uh, overdose an animal with VEGF, will it biologically respond to, to seeing it? And so the, the answer would be, yeah, dogs, if you give them the peptide sequence, the short peptide of VEGF, they'll respond with vascular growth like humans would. And so dogs would be an applicable model. And so I could tell FDA we're going to do our study in dogs. If they don't, there are other proteins that maybe the pathway is only resembles uh, humans and primates. So then I would do monkeys. And then I wouldn't do, and, uh, wouldn't do other species. But monkeys, there's still a little bit of a, one, there's a shortage. So if you go into FDA and say, and automatically say, I'm going to do my study in rats and monkeys. FDA will say, what's the justification for using monkeys instead of dogs? And you'll say, well, monkeys are closer to people, closer to humans, so we just thought we'd use monkeys. They'll say, well, strongly consider using pigs or dogs. 
And the reason is because dogs have multiple litters in a year, and they have 8 to 12, and so you can get a population of dogs pretty quick. And the database for beagle dogs, because they only use beagles. And so if you have neighbors that say, you know, we saw somebody from the university out catching dogs, we think they're doing research on them. They aren't, <laughs> because, because they only do, you only use beagle dogs in, in GLP research. Uh, so you'll have multiple litters. And like rabbits, you have multiple litters. And of course, rat, everybody said breed like rabbits, so you know rabbits is a good model. But monkeys only have one, only cycle once a year, and it takes six months to pop a monkey out, and they have 20% of stillborns. And so it's hard to breed monkeys. And so there's this finite pool of monkeys available. And they're purpose bred. They don't go out and catch them anymore uh, and import them. Now they have monkey farms in Texas. There's actually a couple monkey farms here. Uh, in Texas, Charles River and Covance use, but they, but they breed them. But, so if I, I, FDA knows there's this finite pool, and so they won't just let you do monkeys because you want to. They'll say, you know, there's a lot of drug companies and some of them using, having to use monkeys for a reason. So justify why you're gonna use monkeys. You know, what can you do early? The other sort of things that you'll do uh, is you'll do gene talks and you'll do cardiovascular testing. So ICH guidance has a big guidance on safety farm uh, and drugs that cause cardiovascular toxic toxicity since the fin fin uh, debacle. And so now one of the things you can do early in talks is if I have four compounds that I want to figure out which one I'm going to take forward, I'll run them through a little HERG screening and I'll say, does any of them, do any of them uh, mess up the HERG channel? And if three out of four do, then I have my lead because I have the one that's, that, that keeps going. But I try to set these hurdles uh, early because I want to get drugs weeded out early. But of course, if I work for a little company, I only have one drug. And so I have one company that I worked for that had two candidates. <clears throat> so we ran them through the AIMS and we ran them through the HERG. And I ran them through the AIMS and I said, so uh, they're both mutagenic in AIMS. And then we ran them through the HERG, and I said, well, one of them's got a pretty good EC50, uh, just in about the ballpark of uh, fin, fin And so they say, you know, I presented the results to their board, and they said, so what do, you, what do you think we should do with this drug? Is it dead? And I said, well, so it depends on why you're using it for. It depends on what the risk benefit is. Because if you're telling me that this is going to be an obesity drug uh, and I've got a positive AIMS and a positive HERG, I'm telling you it's dead. If you are using it for some unmet medical need and, and the patient doesn't have anything else, any other treatment options in cancer, maybe I take that risk. But I said, you know, if I was at Large Pharma, I would have killed this drug after the AIMS. I wouldn't even bother running the the HERG because I've got medicinal chemists in the back lab who are cranking out moieties over and over and I just say, you know, you knew that nitrosamine was going to be an issue because it's, that's one of the target moieties that, that cause mutagenicity, so just work with your chemist and, and get it out, take that moiety out. But if you're a little company, you don't have a med chem person, it's like your one company, your one drug that you've got your patent on and you're trying to figure out how to get it to work. Uh, you know, your outlook's a little bit different. And that's the same thing in, in pharmacology driving uh, development. So if you're a little company, you've got one little drug, uh, <clears throat> you don't really want to kill it. And so if I'm doing a xenograft study in mice, instead of choosing the model that's like orthotopic model into the pancreas, that's a little bit harder to cure, I'm going to put it in the foot pad and I'm going to show that, that our drug works and then it cures it. And they, you know, every, and cancer in the foot pad of mice is pretty highly curable. So uh, the, the bar is down here. But, it, you know, if I'm at a large pharma, I might want to set the bar up here because I have multiple candidates that, can, that I can screen through. And so I might do the most aggressive model that I know in a particular disease and say it's got to pass this hurdle. But if I'm a little company and it's the only drug I have, I say, well, it's a, I want my drug to have the best chance to work. So there's this ongoing, you know, how, how, when you think about what model you're going to put it into, how many compounds succeed in this model and then fail in the clinic. You know, pick the model that has the best chance of success.
there aren't. So while, while your question on are how many toxicology studies you have to do are, is pretty well defined by FDA, it's two GLP normally. The number of studies that you have to do showing that your drug works in an animal model isn't defined. And so I've worked on projects where the target was so well known that all we had to show was that we inhibited the target in vitro and we did the GLP talks and we got in the clinic. We didn't have to do any mouse efficacy, rat efficacy. We didn't do, have to do any efficacy models because the target was so well known. Uh, and then there are other ones where you, maybe you say, I, I've done, you know, I'm working on a, with a company now that we've done eight different tumor cell lines in PDX models uh, to take it to FDA. It's a, it's a how much comfort you have. Because FDA really is care, FDA, depending on what the risk benefit for the patients is, uh, FDA is much more concerned about safety than they are will the drug work. So your investigational new drug application is where you'll take all the data that you have uh, and you'll put it in a, probably be in pallets if you've done a bunch of studies, uh, and you'll package it all up and you'll give it to FDA and you're asking FDA to evaluate your animal efficacy, your safety data, and how you make the drug, and what you propose to do in the clinic. And if FDA agrees, then they'll let you run that first clinical trial. And so it's really a request by, by the company to tell FDA that, look, here's a study that we want to run in people. How many ever people? And here's what we're going to do. Here's the, what we're going to monitor. And here's all the data we have to support doing that. And for you guys, INDs can be either commercial or research. So uh, investigator held INDs, you don't have to be a company. Uh, if you were a cancer researcher uh, at a university, uh, you could file an, an IND on your own you know, with your own drug. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you have to do the whole process. You, yeah, so that's a really good question. So the, if I have a drug that you already have an open IND for, so there's a couple of answers for that. If I have a drug that has an IND in a cancer, so I had a drug that we had in Hodgkin's, I had to open an entirely new IND when we went into asthma. But I could cross-reference stuff from my first IND. So I didn't have to do all my talks over. And as long as I didn't change the formulation, I didn't have to do all my manufacturing over. Now, I would have had to if I had changed the manufacturing and I said, well, I have an oral and here's the vehicle uh, for this indication and I'm going to do an injectable over here for this indication. I would have had to do separate CMC packages, but I wouldn't have had to do the talks over. The, the other thing is if I'm using a repurposed drug, I can't say, well, I know that Glaxo had this drug in clinical development, and so I want you to let me start a clinical trial in this indication, uh, and you just look at what they did in the animals and tell me it's okay. Because you have to have a right to reference their material. So I can't just, unless they published it. So that's why I'm not a big publisher. Because if I've published my talks literature, if I've published in the talks literature findings that I've seen, then somebody else could reference those and support if they want to do an indication. Otherwise, they'd have to come to me and say, so how much would you charge me for those studies? But I'd have to, but I'd have to reference them. So you need to convince uh, FDA that there's a reasonable chance it will work. You need to convince them that, there's a, that it's reasonably safe at what you intend to do in the clinic and the risk benefit we've talked quite a bit about. Now, FDA has 30 days to act on an IND. Uh, so getting around day 30, your regulatory person's calling FDA all the time and saying, hey, what do you say, what do you say? If they don't like it, uh, you're okay to proceed. If there's something they don't like, they can put a hold on it. So we had, we, I had a company that I just submitted an IND for in end of first quarter, and it's because they told the shareholders we will submit an IND in the first quarter, 
And you know, if you don't meet that, then the stock kind of goes down a bit, and it's all about money. And so we submitted an IND, and I, and everybody said this is going to be an issue. And sure enough, FDA put a clinical hold on right away, and said, well, you don't have enough uh, manufacturing data, so we don't. You haven't given us enough to show that the drug is stable for 30 days. You haven't given us uh, enough characterization uh, of what the formulation looks like in the capsule thing. You're going to put it in so the dogs, we use a different formulation, rats and dogs. And then we're going to use a different formulation for people. And they said, you haven't characterized that well enough. And they said, until you give us the data on this, and we were changing the manufacturing process, scaling it up to make it in quantities that would use for clinical. And we hadn't done that, and so FDA said, until you provide us with that data, you're on clinical hold and you can't start your trial. So you could have uh, get around a lot of these things by a pre-IND meeting, and FDA will give you one pre-IND pre meeting. Uh, most times you can uh, have it on the phone, or you can just ask for response to questions. But what you do is you get far enough along your development path so that you can ask and form questions to FDA. And then you, put, you assemble everything that you know about the drug with specific questions that you want to answer from FDA. And you don't want to do it too early, uh, because I've worked with a company that was really, really concerned about cell line. And so they, had, uh, they were expressing a protein in insect cells. And they were wondering, you know, what, are, what is FDA going to say about insect, insect cell-derived protein? And so they organized and had their pre-IND meeting, and that was the only question they had. And FDA said, well, if you showed us, if you could characterize the protein well, and, and you'd be good to go. And then they brought me on board, and they said, so what animals should we, what species should we do the tox program in? Because it's a human protein. And I said, what did FDA say? Well, we didn't ask that question. And so, you know, they, you can ask FDA a whole lot of questions, and you want to have them all ready because you only get one chance there. And I said, well, I don't, you know, I'm guessing now because I don't know what FDA is going to want because you should have asked this question when you had your pre IND meeting. So, you have, if you're thinking about uh, going to FDA and saying, uh, we got some questions on our development. Have as much stuff together as you can. Have, know what questions you want them to answer on your manufacturing. Know what questions you want to ask them on your clinical. So on your clinical protocol, maybe you have, you have uh, a drug that you don't want to go into normal healthies for some reason, and you want to go right into patients. So you, ha you have the first protocol and the synopsis, and you ask FDA, if we give you this data, uh, will you allow us to go into patient population? And then you'll get an answer. No, we'd strongly recommend that you consider normal healthy volunteers as your first clinical trial. And now you know. Well, they've kind of told you, no, they're not going to let you. Uh, so ask enough questions, have enough data that you can ask questions at the pre-IND meeting to get answers, to, because that really drives your program. And I think that's an inflection point. So I talked to somebody just this week that was asking, uh, when should we think about licensing uh, our technology out? When should we start to approach large pharma? And I said, it, it depends on how much money you want. Because the value of your program starts down like this. And so you might have a really good idea, but the value is pretty low. And you kind of hit a little bit of an inflection point when you've been to FDA to have your pre-IND meeting, because now you've got a roadmap, and you can show pharma, we asked these questions, and FDA uh, gave us concurrence that we, if we did this, this, and this, we'd get in a clinical trial. So there's a little bit of an inflection point there. And then when I file my IND, it's another inflection point. And then when I finished my phase one and I didn't have any huge AEs that were showstoppers, I hit another inflection point. So the answer to when should I approach pharma about licensing my compound is whenever you think you want the money, knowing that, that the value is a lot more if I take a program that I've already won a clinical trial in people, uh, the value to pharma is huge and to you, is a lot more than if you go with just an idea and say, hey, I did this one mouse study, and this was really cool. We'd like you to buy it. The other risk is that, remember, that, that pharma is there to make money. And so I told this com these 
couple investigators. So one of the problems is if you go and you show this technology to pharma, uh, they've signed a CDA, but, they're, but they still may go back with your data and your research and say, so figure out how to get around this, because this is really interesting. And they're so early, we can catch them in a, you know, they've worked on this project for two years, but we'll catch them in a month with our people on it. Uh, so you don't want to bring them in too early. So you're, we've already covered on what issues do you want FDA concurrence? So this is a, has anybody been to a pre-ID meeting? You go in, uh, you, when you go to FDA, it's this huge sprawling campus and you drive up and you have to check in, check all your bags, and you get an hour, only an hour, and you get no slides, and you've given them the background material and somebody leads your team and they go through your questions. And, and you can't say, well, we'd like to show you this slide of, because there isn't a slide projector in the room. But, you know, it's FDA sits on one side and you sit on the other side, but they put their pants on uh, just like you do. And they have a desire to help you move your product along if they think it's a good product. So while you're scared to death when you go in the first time and you're thinking they're going to ask you a question, like in when you guys had senior seminar or when you had to do seminars in your, in your graduate work and there was always one person in the class that wanted to ask questions just to make you look stupid. There's nobody like that at FDA. They're really there to help you. And you know, you'll sit for an hour and you'll have one person keeping track of your time saying, okay, so we had, I had one uh, a couple weeks ago that I said, I'm not sure where the time's gonna break out, but we need to be done with the CMC and the talks questions by 40 minutes into the meeting because we need to at least have 20 minutes to talk about clinical. And so, you know, we had somebody saying, okay, so we haven't completely resolved the talks issue, but we really think it's important to get on to clinical, so let's go on to, because otherwise, at a, in an hour, they don't say, oh, well, this is a really interesting project. Let's sit around and talk a little bit more. They all get up and they say, okay, that was a meeting, good meeting, and they shake your hands and, and that's it. So you, you have to have somebody really watching the time. So to summarize the hour, protect your IP so don't publish too early. Uh, development of what you want to do, uh, what we call target product profile. Having that early is really essential. And discuss with FDA early, but go and discuss completely what it is that you want to discuss with FDA. And I didn't bring a lot of business cards, so that's my email. I've, I really like to help people, so if you say, I got some questions on what do you think I should do, uh, I work with a lot of uh, graduate students, postdocs, uh, people to just say, you know, here's, what, here's some things you th should think about doing now to add value, and so I'm happy to do that. Thank you, thank you, Jeff. Well, that, that completes the, uh, uh, the seminar series for this academic year. We are going to run it again in the next academic year. We're also developing a curriculum that goes into each of these four core subjects into a great deal more uh, detail and discussion and exercise. And uh, so uh, um, be on the lookout for that. It's, uh, to be honest, what we're actually doing is we're, we're going to be copying the program that you have at Stanford, which is called the SPARC program. And so, uh, like I said, uh, we're going to be developing a, a, a deeper uh, curriculum on these, and as well as running the, uh, the seminar series over again, okay? So tell your friends and colleagues about it, and uh, thank you very much for your attention and participation.